This is the K-Pop Cast, and in this episode, we talk about Bicha. However you say their name. Uh, <laughs> the group that we can't pronounce. <laughs> the, the group, JYP's new group, uh, America to Korea group. Uh, we discuss, are we in Gen 5? And we debate, is it Zero Base 1 or Rise? Who is the new 5th Gen leader? We also go through other spicy topics like, you know, this being the end of Blackpink, Red Velvet, who assembles difficulties and, and touring schedule. And uh, what? We also talk about ATs and just like who's on top nowadays. So anything else that you guys wanted to say or add? I mean, listen, I will stand by the fact that we are not in Gen 5. So kind of hard to pick a leader for Gen 5 if we're not there yet. I think we are in the season where we need comfy and cozy songs. Oh, yes. That we get too. Into those. Yes. Oh, yes. D.O. The right. man always delivers. That's right. So before we get into the spicy topics, we're going to warm you up with some cozy, comfy hit replays. Uh, oh, hey, but before we get into hit replays, don't forget to join the K-pop cast listener fam on Slack. We've got a link to join that space in the episode description. And now for our hit replays. It's Teresa. I'm the co-host of the podcast, It's a K-Pop Thing. Happy to be joining on this episode. Hi, everyone. I'm Syed. I'm the founder of Genius Korea, which is part of the big yellow lyric website, Genius. And I'm excited to be here. And I'm DJ Peter Lowe, and hit replays are what we call K-Pop songs you should totally check out. So, Syed, kick us off. What is your hit replay? So my hit replay is the heartwarming love song for this fall that everyone should know. It is Somebody by Dio of EXO. So in case you don't know who Dio of EXO is, um, he is the main vocalist, I believe, of the K-pop group EXO, and he is a very popular idol actor. He has starred in lots of dramas. Uh, he's back with his second mini album uh, called Expectations, and Somebody is the lead single from that album. So tell us why it's a hit replay. So for me, it's a hit replay because it is such an easy song to listen to. Uh, the melodies and the lyrics are very inviting. He has a very soft vocal tone for the entire song. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a really cute song that you can listen to while in the background, if you're doing work, if you're studying, you can just have it in the background. And it's Yeah, it's perfect for fall weather as well. So, yeah, that's why I've been listening to it a, a lot recently. I feel like it needs to be accompanied by like a latte or uh, <laughs> a sugary yeah. coffee drink. You know, I'm really glad that you said that it has just like, it's like perfect for fall season because it is a song that just makes me feel really cozy and like mm-hmm. warm mm-hmm. and it, evo- you know, evokes all of those uh, soft feelings and I love Dio. I love EXO. People who have heard me before on the podcast have heard me talk about probably EXO. If not on this podcast, at least on ours. Um, And Dio has one of those remarkable voices. uh, Just, just I think, uh, among all types of like vocalists, not just like in K-pop, where it's very rich. Like Mm -hmm. it has this like sense of depth. Like he, he's not somebody whose tone. Uh, excuse me, goes really, really high. You know, like in EXO, we have Chen for that, right? We have yeah. Baekhyun hitting the super, super crazy high notes. But Dio is like the solid contender who always just comes in and delivers like the really rich melodies. And like this song is just, I don't know. I love it. I'm really happy you picked it. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, his voice is like very, um, as you said, it has a lot of texture to it. And so it doesn't have to be like a really soaring ballad mm-hmm. or it doesn't have to be like something really deep. Mm-hmm. It can just be like a 
cute pop song, like a folk song, you know, and it's just enjoyable to listen to. And the music video is really cute as well, if you want to check it out. Um, he, it's very much like a K drama, you know. He is, <laughs> I think, he is like on a set of a advertisement or something, and like they are uh, the female lead and him, and like going on dates and stuff. So yeah, it's really cute. All right, so I'm here to help Teresa <laughs> with our <laughs> replay. Uh, well, you, you just didn't want to think about it, but we were talking offline about the song that is the number one song in K-pop right now. It is a teases. Bouncing. Slow it down, make it bounce. Chicken with the fry. Chong down a spicy. Chong yang with your vibe. If you wanna know how, I can show you right now. Only man, did you bounce? All right, so if you didn't already know, um, ATs is a boy group out of KQ Entertainment. They consist of eight members, whose names I'm going to mispronounce. Um, Hong Hong Jung. Hong Jun. Hong Jun. Okay. Y- y- you know what? You guys say the names. I'll let you guys <laughs> say the names. Okay, so it's Hong Jung, Song Hwa, Yun Ho, Yo Sang, San, Mingi, Wo Young, and Jung Ho. And they debuted in 2018 with a ultimate like banger clanger of an album mm-hmm. with yeah. uh, what was it pirate I want to say uh, pirate was king pirate king yeah oh my gosh that one goes so hard um, and say my name is like one of my favorite yeah. K-pop songs of all time yeah. it's right up there very iconic for um, sure. and in 2023 ATS released. 10 EPs. So these boys. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. It's as of. 20. Oh, excuse me. As yeah. of June of 20. <laughs> They're overworked. They're not that overworked. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, dang, 10 EPs in one year. <laughs> that's too much for K pop. <laughs> Even, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even by K pop standards, that's, that's definitely being overworked. Yeah. Yeah. So please forgive me. Yeah. I, I, as of 2023, they've had uh, 10 EPs. They've often been referred to as the uh, global performance idols by Korean media and dubbed the quote unquote fourth generation leaders by the Korean Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism. Mm, and they've sold over fighting words. 4 million physical albums worldwide. Um, they were, their accolades include Worldwide Fans' Choice at the 2019 and 2020 Mnet Asian Music Awards and um, Bong. Bong Song, Bong, Bong, Song. Bong Song Awards um, at the 4th Fact Music Awards and 30th and 31st in the Soul Music Awards. Um, they've also served as the official global ambassadors for Korean culture and tourism. And uh, I mean, I, I would add that they've also just given like completely sold out stadium tours and shows um, in the United States. Yeah. All right. So, Teresa, like, tell me, like, uh, I I know you didn't have a lot of time to think about this, but surely there's reasons why this is a hit replay for you. (laughs) Yeah. So I will say two things. One, um, I am not somebody who can say that, like, since ATZ's debut, I've been really, really closely following them. I know that there are fans who, like, with that first EP were diehard um, A-Tiny, I think it's the fandom name, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I will say that, you know, I'll admit it, like, it took me a while to come around to ATZ. And the thing that I always heard about them was, you know, if you see them live, like, it all makes sense uh, because they are performance idols. And I got to see them at KCON, and let me tell you, they really, really do put on an incredible show. Um, So that's really when they caught my attention, when I finally got to see them live. And then of all their releases, now that I've had a chance to go back and listen to uh, their discography, like I really, really like their stuff, Mm -hmm. but Bouncy just hits 
all the right, like, like it just hits every check mark, you know, in terms of just like what I love about a K-pop song. It's like, what, what? fun. Okay. It's fun. It's playful. It's high energy. There's memorable choreography. And it is a song that automatically like puts you in a mood, you know? And those are all things what, that what I particularly... Do, do I need to do like the like if we were if we had video right now I'd be doing the choreo. That's the kind like of mood that I want to be in. Mood? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, it makes you want to go. I yes, like I know you, Peter. Don't play with me. I know that you've DJed parties and everybody's yeah, well, like doing the choreo for this sure, song. Sure, sure. So but like, I, 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 I'm asking because like you know different songs can evoke different emotions in people, and I, I just want to know you know what what is it for you? I th- it's fun. Like yeah. K-pop to me is ultimately fun music. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. like every iconic K-pop song gets people up and like without even thinking they're doing the choreo for the song, you know, like mm-hmm. even the people that don't do dance covers, they're suddenly like at their desk and they're like, oh, yeah, fancy yeah. like <laughs> by twice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like Alexis, uh, my co-host on It's a K-pop thing. And I have talked about this before where it's like. You know, you have to be careful with like what K-pop playlist you're, uh, you have on while you're trying to do work because there are certain songs that it's like, oh, oh yeah, it's kind of hard definitely. to do work because, <laughs> like, you know, you're you're dancing along a little too much. And this is Bouncy by ATs is exactly that. It's a song that, you know, makes you uh, <laughs> want to get bouncy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got a really good build and drop. Um yeah, I yeah. typically. It's one of those. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's one of those songs that like you automatically just are fluent in Korean and sing along to the entire. <laughs> yes. <thing. laughs> you know, like I. That's how I define iconic K-pop songs. Where mm. I'm like, I am fluent in Korean right now. Okay, <laughs> you do not. Yeah, nobody interrupt me. <laughs> right. Yeah. There, there have been times when I'm like DJing and like you can see everyone singing along to a song with, for the clear, Korean lyrics. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, give people a space to sing and shout. I'll take the the vocals out of the song while they're saying it, and then I notice sometimes people will, will, will all kind of stop and kind of like mumble. <laughs> <laughs> I, why are you gotta make them self conscious like that, Peter? Uh, well, why I, you gotta I, make them self conscious like I, that? <laughs> I'm just assuming that they actually know it like a hundred percent. But um, it is funny to see it, like when everyone kind of like they they actually laugh like you can see them like <laughs> you can see they're, they're trying to sing it but anyway yeah uh 80s like if if i had to say like if there are like a number one song that is like always requested at k-pop dj gig parties like it is this song like this is the number one song i think number two would probably be um either new jeans super shy or new jeans eta followed by mm. uh g idol mm. queen card like those are like the top yeah. songs right now at least that people like to dance to at events and then like maybe like fourth or, or fifth would be like stray kids um i don't know like something stray kids it could be a, a little old song like do do uh excuse me god's menu or um a new song like super bowl or something mm. anyway uh, so, but like th- this song, it's got like such a good build, like, it, like for the pre-chorus and the drop, it's got a, such a strong drop. And then you, you see everyone kind of do the shopping cart dance, mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah. the shopping cart dance. <laughs> well, they, they'll, they'll like, they'll get, like the dancers who know will mm-hmm. kind of get in a line and everyone kind of does like a sort of like mini, like Congo esque line. Oh yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's part of the uh, choreo. Mm-hmm. The choreo. Yeah. But it's just funny when. Everyone is doing it. That's a it. very long line. Yeah. 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 And so they're all kind of moving around the dance floor. It reminds me of um, ATS's other song, Say My Name. Because mm. that also has a shopping cart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Kai's Rover. Oh, yeah. 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 It did. Yeah. Have you seen that clip of um, ATS and Zykers doing the bouncy dance challenge? No, they did the, they, they did the conga line thing, and Zykers has like ten members. ATS is like what eight members? That's like eighteen people in a line. It was like <laughs> a never-ending series of idols just like coming out of the door. Oh, that's hilarious! Oh, I'm gonna have to check that out. Um, yeah, 
it, it, and I I would say like because it's such a like a banger clanger drop like it, it's like the song that you have to play next to um, August D's Day with Cha and Stray Kids is God's Menu. Mm. It's like it, it may be BTS mic drop. It's like it right in that sequence mm. of songs. Yeah, it's a good song. Good pick. And I, I, I hate that I've got that like squeaky parrot voice in my head. You know what? I remember uh, hearing, I think I read about the parrot voice like before I actually saw the music video. And uh-huh. when I finally got around to seeing the music video, like I could not stop laughing. Like my <laughs> sister came in from the other room and was just like, what is going on? And I was like, there's a parrot. And then she, I was like, okay, it's, never mind. Just, just watch the video. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I guess we'll move on to our next hit replay. Yeah. So my hit replay is from an artist whose name I cannot pronounce. Uh, Kuno Chan, I think. So his name I looked up, it's Ku Won Chan. Ku Won Chan. And then I don't know why he stylized it like that. Yeah. Okay. That's like a stage name thing. Well, it's Ku Won Chan and his Bossa Nova Electronica song. Closer. So if you didn't know who this artist artist is, and I, I didn't know myself until like 30 minutes ago. Um, Kuan Chen is a R&B singer songwriter from South Korea under Magic Strawberry Sound, um, and according to K Profiles, uh, he made his debut in 2017 with the EP Repetition. He had his military service from 2019 to 2021, um, and he's also, well, just as an R&B singer, he's performed in a few places. So he's been on. Curves YouTube channel um, where he's performed some of his uh, songs. But anyway, it's a hit replay be- for me because um, I don't know. I-, I guess like as an intellectual, <laughs> like, like like when when I'm like really listening to music and not listening to the music for the sake of um, I don't know staying current with what's happening in K-pop, like but just. I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it. Uh, like, I'm, I'm just really into this, like, sub-genre of, like, Korean indie music where it's, like, very electronica sounding. Um, this is very adjacent to, I want to say, like, Strap, uh, what, what is it? Hummingbird, Hummingbird Stereo, who I, this is another artist, I think, under Strawberry, Magic Strawberry Sound, um, where it's, like, acoustic instruments but like electronically uh spliced and sampled together in a very coffee house sort of vibe mm. um mm. but with this song in particular like I'm, I'm gonna describe it in a very weird way so like i i'm gonna make a reference that like maybe like all but like two of our listeners like, will get so like for all two of you like this is this one's for you guys but there's this like really old uh, Super Nintendo video game called Chrono Trigger, mm. and the way that like what is it, 32-bit era sound and, and music sounds, it's very similar to this, <laughs> um, except for like you know modern, um, you know again modern acoustic sampling. Um, and electronic splicing, but it's, it's like the same vibe from Chrono Trigger's Secret of the Forest. All, all two of you will get that reference. Um, and the, I don't know, it's a cute song. Like, I, I, I couldn't really tell you what it means. Um, it's got this like long description in the um, to accompany the video, uh, talking about the uh, the album epilogue. Um, and clarifying that like hey an epilogue isn't meant to be the end of the story but it's meant to be like an additional story sort of after the end um of like a book or uh of a movie or something 
Um, so that I think that's what they're trying to evoke the feeling of with this song, with this album. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just a really fun bossa nova uh, groovy vibe. So anyway, it's my hit replay. I love that, like, now that we're in September, suddenly we're we're craving all of these uh, cozy songs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. I listened to the song that you, um, the closer, and yeah, it, it actually reminded me that I, I looked up the artist and I remembered he has done a OST for the show Yumi Cell. <gasps> Wait, so, he did? Yeah, he Which has song? an OST. Um, I think I'm going to have to look called, that up. I love that drama. Um, it, it's called Between Hearts and it's like one of the f- very first ones that was played in the season. Okay. So, yeah. It was like, oh, interesting. I, I love making connections between things that I already know and then, like, new things. Because a lot of the times, like, indie artists, especially, like, they are songwriters for some of our, you know, uh, recognizable K-pop songs and stuff like that. So, yeah, mm. that was really interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that's it for Hit Replays for this week. Um, let's move on to, in place of Hot Issue, uh, we're going to do a sort of game slash show and tell activity. Um, so the idea being that, uh, like, uh, you know, we, we kind of have a sense of like who's on top right now. Like, you know, maybe it's BTS, ATs, Stray Kids, New Jeans, La Seraphim. Um, so those are all the tier ones, but what, what do we think are going to be the new breakout stars? So the, either the tier two, tier three groups that are soon set to be the new tier one group or like the new, like S class, like who who do we think is not yet an S class, but soon will be. Mm. Um, so I, we were talking before this show, like, Hey, let's kind of, let's set like a, let's calibrate. Let, let's uh, make sure we're on the on the same uh, wavelength here. Like, wh- who do we think is currently winning? So I I just gave off a bunch of names. Like, would you would you guys dispute that? Would you say that there's anyone else who would say is like number one on top? Like, who's in the top ten? I guess. Well, I think it's funny that you mentioned BTS right off the bat. Not because they're. I mean, and I say this as like an army who's been to many BTS concerts. But I think right now it's an interesting time in K-pop because BTS is obviously like they're all enlisting um, and this whole year has really just been their solo tracks that have been um, charting well because that's what they can release. They can release their solo projects. So in that, and I guess like a landscape where BTS is restricted to only releasing their individual solo side projects we've seen all of these other K-pop groups from fourth gen really rise to the top. So like you mentioned, I agree, Stray Kids is definitely up there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think especially with their win at the um, MTV uh, VMAs, mm-hmm. they like really got a lot of press from that. And I think even though S-Class isn't uh, their strongest album, I think as like a group, it's the fact that they still won you know, over a group like TXT, like really shows just how powerful their fandom is right now. So I think that they're definitely like the top group right now in terms of fourth gen acts. Um, I think TXT is up there. Um, I think right now Ive is also up there. We haven't mentioned them. We talk a lot about new genes here in the US, but I think like Ive is the it girl group in Korea. Um, and even though, like, I don't see them anytime soon releasing, like, a sold-out tour in the U.S., um, I think mm-hmm. people still listen to their songs a lot. So I definitely think that they're up there. I think New Jeans is oh, up the, there. The gays love Ive. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I I mean, <laughs> I love Ive. I'm not gay. But, like, I love Ive. I think, again, very K-pop sound. Um, I think in terms of other groups that I would put up there um, that are winning right now. I think La Seraphim's still a heavy hitter also. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish, you know, I wouldn't put them in tier one, 
but I feel like um, Enmix is still kind of in that like second tier where uh, yeah tier two yeah I I would tier even two say like borderline tier three for Enmix unfortunately yeah like, uh, and ATs would be tier one sorry yeah I forgot. yeah oh yeah ATs for tier one for sure yeah yeah I think um, I would add twice in tier one. They have been able to do really good. Yeah. Very consistent also with their releases and their promotions have been really good. Sold out stadium tours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Everyone thought that it was not going to be twice. It was going to be Blackpink who does the first stadium tour in the US or whatever. But it ended up being twice, which was very interesting. Um, I think Black twice Pink has Soul- more universal, just slightly more universal appear, appeal than, than Blackpink. Like they Blackpink is, still has like huge appeal yeah. to a wide spectrum, but twice is just even larger. I just think like, because twice was never marketed as like a very global group from the start. They were mm-hmm. more for like South Korea's na- group, nation's group, right? You know, things like that. Um, Blackpink was always more for like, they were always marketed as a global icon thing like that. So it was just an interesting thing that Twice ended up being so successful in the US. Um, Blackpink obviously followed. Um, They have been doing really good, but, and that has to do with their management or whatever. We can, (laughs) we don't need to get into that. (laughs) But um, Sidebar, sidebar. (laughs) Sidebar, yes. YG. Um... But yeah, no, twice I would definitely put them up in um, tier one. And I I feel like they're going to be, if JYP does it right, then I feel like they're going to be invited to more American award shows and events and festivals and things like that following year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All I right. agree with, I agree with that. And I, it's funny because I wouldn't, in my mind, Blackpink and Twice, I feel like are in the same tier I mean, BTS is such an outlier, but I feel like mm. they're competing on that same level. So in my mind, I would, I wouldn't, I didn't even think of them because I was like, they're already like up there, you know, up yeah. there. Yeah, and it's so weird. Like Gen Three is like the legacy group. Yeah, at this point. Now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Seventeen is another one, which yes. I feel like this year oh, they yeah. stepped into tier one. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think they're like right on that cusp. I think they're one. like I, I, I go ahead. I think they entered tier one. I mean their album FML, it sold like what three million copies and it wasn't even supposed to sell that much. Like Planet Everybody was not I feel ready like was surprised that. by that. Yeah. They were the before yeah. was it before Zero Base One, they were like the most sold um, yeah. boys group boy group album of twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um and it was just like because Especially because if you look at the pattern, um, if they are trying to promote in the US, they're going to release it like a Western album. So like a midnight release. FML was like this Korean title track um, uh, mini album released at 6 p.m. Korean time, which is the middle of the night for the US. (laughs) And so their label was not expecting it to blow up like that. And they, they hadn't like, planned any western promotions for it anything like that it just so happened that it sold so much got so popular then they were like oh crap we better like promote this properly and like ship out all these albums so (laughs) we can chart on time and stuff like that so yeah it was very haphazard um i i yeah i think it makes sense to put them up there in terms of like the heavy hitters right now for tier one in the fourth in the third fourth gen landscape that we're in right now for sure i hmm. you don't agree <laughs> I, I think uh look to be clear their songs get people dancing they've got really good party songs um but i just don't get like song requests for the for 17 songs like i do from the other tier one groups so I think he, what you're getting at, Peter, is like the different criteria here. I feel like Sayed yeah, and we... I are using like sales for albums, concerts, like tour dates, like that kind of stuff. But and you're obviously going off of like songs that get people hype, you know, and it's funny because like I I'm a carrot, like I love Seventeen. Um, they're one of my um, alt groups. Uh, 
And I almost, I'm like embarrassed right now to say that because like they didn't come to top of mind. And I think it's also because mm. for me, they're an older group who's still releasing music and has slowly been rising to the top. Yeah, like but, their ascension yeah, but, hasn't but, been yeah. fast enough for it to feel like a really yeah. big win in the same way sure. that Twice has been like a long journey for the fandom as yeah. well. Well, okay, look, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Like by that same measure, Teresa, like super banger clanger right hot also banging clinger really good dance moving song i think it was our, our contender for song of the year last year uh left right you know there one was cupid shuffle and then mm-hmm. um interestingly like very nice like are you nice like that that song mm-hmm. like people are <laughs> like it's it's like the new i mean it's a gen 3 song but it's like the new gen 2 version throwback that like people everyone knows like super junior sorry sorry 21 i am the best like it, it's that same sort of category of a throwback uh, but like even acknowledging that they've got all these like really popular dance songs and these really genuine bops that people like a good portion of the crowd dance to i just don't see the same fervor and like you know, oh, you have to play this song. Um, like that's because- interesting to me because like then then I would say like okay, where's the fervor for New Jeans? People like New Jeans songs, but like are oh, people they, crazy they are, about like oh, New they Jeans? Are like that shit crazy for New Jeans. But that's yeah. what I'm saying. They're they're crazy for the singles. I don't know that yeah. the fandom powering new jeans is there and we're seeing that right now yeah with, but like, the fandom they're not for selling, they're not they're, they're not selling tickets they're not moving tickets for new jeans right now in the really US. okay they're not mm. so I, I, I and did, album well. sales also not they are selling well but like not nearly as much so i guess i'm basing my tier one criteria in terms of the fandom powering the group and even if, and like I said, FML for 17 wasn't their best um, mm-hmm. album. And I say this as a carrot who loves a bunch of all their stuff. Um, I think it's just people bought it because people are starved for like 17 music. And the fandom is so die hard that they will monetarily support them. Yeah, yeah. But like New Jeans has like entered mainstream. Like it, I it, think... It's- Yeah, it's very easy for girl groups to be able to enter mainstream because people, Mm. it's just like it resonates easier than a a boy group. Girl groups have always done good in digital sales. They do do really well with music show wins. Like a girl group debuts, like five days later, they have a first win. Boy Mm. group debuts, it takes like two years to get a first win and the entire fandom has to collaborate with like other fandoms to get it done. (laughs) So it's like, it's historically um, girl groups just tend to do better with the general public and they're, they have more iconic singles. People cannot maybe name the members. Maybe they cannot name the albums or whatever, but they will know the song. For example, like lots of people know Oh My God and Ditto. They have yeah. not seen the music video for Oh My God and Ditto. <laughs> they know the song, but they don't know the music video or the members, but they recognize the song. Mm. So I feel like New G is, is going off of that right now, more so than a very strong fandom rooting like behind them you who's like voting and you know doing hashtag campaigns and twitter yeah. things and all of that well case in point 50 50 is cupid exactly oh, oh yeah, that, yeah that's a good question that should i should keep should 50 50 be up there like no 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 no, no. no. they I, are yeah. a unless things dramatically change Unfortunately, fifty fifty is a one hit wonder. Yeah. Okay, I I tragically, sadly agree with that. Yeah, I love fifty fifty, and they're yeah, it's sad. I do want to say like their first EP was amazing, and people should really think about uh, like listen to it if they want. Um, not judging just by Cupid, but yeah, unfortunately, I would not put fifty fifty. They were a very strong contender for like the breakout star of this year. But then people got greedy. So. Okay, uh, <laughs> TXT should they be a? I feel like they're they're tier two, almost tier one. Yeah, that is interesting. I feel like they're on the cusp. 
yes. Yeah. I think they are tier two so far. It, I would I think, say, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Teresa. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I think they're, I think TXT is like on the cusp between like tier two and tier one right now because the strategy that Hybe is using with their new singles, which is to have them collaborate more with Western artists yeah. um, uh, and Latin artists mm -hmm. is I think like an interesting experiment, but it's not winning over new fans and it's not doing anything for the existing fans that, you know, they were, it's like people look like, I like TXT, I've seen them in concert and I like their most quote unquote K-pop singles, you know? So this, these mm. newer releases, I feel like are kind of in a way, I think hindering their growth, to mm. be honest. Well, I, I, sorry, just to weigh in on TXT. Uh, what I've noticed is that if I'm doing a 21 and up night, TXT isn't as popular. But if yes. I'm doing a 16 mm, and up yeah. night, yeah. they are very popular. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. It's Yes. When I saw Alexis and I went to go see TXT at Microsoft Theater last year, and I went with my teenage nieces as well. And Alexis and I literally looked around the fandom and we were like, these girls, I'm sorry, well, not mostly, not all girls, but mostly, right? Um, I was like, these fans are here with their parents. Like, <laughs> that's how young they are. Yes. You know? And, <laughs> oh and Alexis and I looked at each other and we were like, what? You know? Like, there was literally um, a person in fr directly in front of us who I could tell, you know, she was definitely a teenager and her much, much older, you know, parental guardian <laughs> was to her right. Um, and, uh, you know, same thing. I looked to my right. There was a mom drinking a nice cocktail, like scrolling on her phone, smiling because she was, you know, happy to be a good parent who took her child. And then the, you know, her daughter was presumably her daughter right next to her was just like having that, like, this is my first concert face, facial yeah. expression, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm not even kidding. I, I think I remember Alexis tweeting about that. <laughs> the demographic is way too young for like, but I, I think I, I remember felt that. Old. So, so look, you know, given everything that we're saying about TXT, if we think that TXT isn't tier one now, could they be tier one soon? Because of uh, this like breakout, you know, hey, new generation coming up. Um, that is interesting. My gut tells me, I think they'll move up as just like a heavy, like a, a solid contender, you know? Um, if they continue releasing like good singles and whatnot. I don't know that I necessarily see their fandom growing tremendously. Um, I just, I feel like they've kind of settled into, I don't know. I, I just don't see them. I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I struggle to see them really growing tremendously. I, if, go ahead. I think um, their fandom is becoming a bit more organized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the sense that their latest, their upcoming album has already recorded a million pre-orders. Like that's, I think they have hit their highest point so far. So like the fandom is getting more organized, getting more like, okay, we need to do, do this and that to like, you know, get them a number one on the chart or whatever. Hmm. Um, I feel like initially their fandom was a little bit like, we don't know what's going on. Everyone was comparing them to BTS. And like that whole overshadowing thing that was happening, that was something that was, uh, that they struggled with. Uh, TXT struggled with it and their fandom struggled with it as well. Mm. So, I mean, I don't particularly see them as, uh, the way I'm thinking about it is like, can they win artists of the year? At an Korean award show, I don't think TXT is there yet. Where they really, can, they can uh, no, um, overpower so. the other okay. artists and better. win hmm. artists of the year. And you know so, why I yeah. say that also because I remember we we just had a whole conversation about Seventeen, right? Like, mm -hmm. what was that recent? It was kind of recent, 
awards show where um, Seventeen performed and there was a bunch of other, you know, K-pop groups in the audience. And it wasn't Seventeen. I'm sorry. It was um, it was um, BSS. So mm, the subunit, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they performed and they got all of the K-pop idols like dancing, dancing. Yeah. and yeah. going crazy. And that to me was just like, wow, it's because all of these, even though they're fourth gen, they're looking up to 17, you know, in that way. Yeah. And like, I just don't know that if seven, if TXT did that right now, at least, or yeah. they would have that kind of reaction. Well, 17 has has got the the TikTok catchy dance bop songs down you know like they they've i think they've they've really fighting uh, is also a very catchy song yeah yes, just, yeah it, it is yeah. like it's not just bss it's just like the song is really good yeah it, it, it's a good song but like it, it's also one that 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 that's like i would hold uh fighting up as an example of like tiktok optimized you know choreography um mm. In, in in song, uh, so sorry. Going back to TXT, if I can offer a couple more data points, sure. Cat and dog, you guys remember that song? Yeah, mm -hmm. wasn't it their debut? No, uh, from their debut. Album, from yeah. their debut. That song still gets requests, and people like request it in an almost like laughing, joking way. Like, play the part where they start making all the cat and dog noises. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, this is a bit of a tangent, but that song is the reason why there's barking at concerts. <laughs> ah, right. Okay, hot take. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, yeah. You can trace really? it back. So they yeah, had their Tamar showcase. Tamar also published the, the story on this too, talking about yeah, this. Yeah, because I told Tamar. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, you told her. Okay. I so told her because you can trace it back. So they had a showcase tour right after they debuted. Okay. Um, in the U.S. And when the cat and dog song plays, that's part of the cheer guide. So Interesting. So that thing is part of the cheering. So because fans started doing that, it started becoming a thing where, you know, fans started doing it for other artists as well. Because mm. before that, you can't... Um, that was, I think, in 2018, I think, that, sh that showcase tour happened. Before that, people did not used to do that. <laughs> You know what's so funny? I'm glad you say that because I actually used to think that, or I pre I thought prior to you saying this, I really thought that barking was a thing that fanboys did because it was like, quote unquote, cooler to do than like, um, you know, just screaming their heads off. So I, and I remember well, this because I saw it at the twice, it. at the twice concert. That was when I heard barking, right. like, crazy like i mean i didn't hear that at, like bts or anything like that but like when i went to see twice um at the forum it was crazy yeah. oh yeah how mm. barking how many people were barking and so much so that jihyo it's like there's a clip of her i think that went viral where she's just like encouraging people and she's like what is going on <laughs> you know she's so confused and then she's like all right keep it going keep it going <laughs> yeah but, uh, I think that's definitely part of it. I, I think that that's maybe what what gave it like gas and momentum to keep going. But I, I, I I'm I I believe Syed's theory, mm. um, for for its start. Okay, so we're we're okay. Oh, and one last thing on on TXG tinnitus. Their what is not even their main track. Their B side that gets requested all the time. Um, so, okay, so I think we, we've more or less calibrated to what are the tier one. So let, let's go around. What What's your breakout group that you would nominate for being like, hey, this is like the next road paving uh, group? Who, who's going first? <laughs> uh, well, I can, I, I, oh, go ahead, Sid. I go can ahead. go. Um, yeah. I mean, speaking of like, they haven't really... I don't think they are at two, tier two. They are still tier three, but I feel like they are on the way of breaking out, and that is P1 Harmony. Um, I went to their show earlier this year, and I only know like three songs out of <laughs> their entire discography. But their entire show was sold out, first of all, and that 
kind of production and that kind of energy i felt like it belonged in a bigger venue mm. um they had lots of confetti blowing for a lot of a couple of the songs they had big screens and cameras following them and you can see it on the screen which is not typically what someone would do for a smaller venue because you can just see the stage um but it felt like a very arena t- kind of concert being played in an auditorium and so i feel like they definitely have a potential to like if their management does it right um they are capable of you know becoming the next i don't know like 80s level or straight kids level if they keep going really well yeah be yeah. one harmony I really am glad that you mentioned P1 Harmony because I think that they are a group that going back to the power of fandoms in K-pop, like mm. I think that their fandom is uh, has like a lot of potential to be really, really powerful because like a lot of, the, I'm going to say this, I feel like part of the reason that P1 Harmony is hitting so hard and has the potential to really like move into tier one is because they know how to utilize social media right now better than a lot of the other K-pop groups. And I feel like a lot of people discover, myself included, start listening to P1 Harmony because of those TikToks that Kiho is doing, you know, and like the other members are doing and that fans are doing. And so much of like what really helps a group, like you said, organize and like come together and say like guys we got to like support this next comeback is when you have fans like even casual fans like sharing creating you know reposting whatever the term is um fan generated content you know so like when you have a k-pop group that's like their marketing team doesn't have to worry so much (laughs) like about generating (laughs) content that's that's the k-pop way that is the k-pop no, business but model what I'm, like i feel but like i think right now i don't think everybody let me use la seraphin as okay. like a, a, another example like mm-hmm. la seraphin is great on tiktok and like ig reels whatever you watch it on you know if yeah. you're old like me you're watching it on in, on instagram you know <laughs> um or if but you're like, really old you're you're re- watching that on like a respectable platform like facebook you know a few (laughs) weeks or months after i didn't even know how they make it over there but okay um i don't know what the workflow looks like i was gonna say youtube shorts maybe (laughs) i know i was thinking youtube shorts um anyway so like la seraphin what i mean by um the difference here is like their management is having them do the dance challenges with other k-pop idols and like the same you know lobby etc cetera, etc cetera. like they're so it's getting a bit more forced and pushed so it's more contrived. like this is the dance challenge this is the thing you're gonna do this is the clip versus like yeah. p1 harmony they just do lives and they're stupid and funny mm-hmm. do you get what i'm saying yeah like yeah, yeah. it's it's like straight kids I, right now unfortunately we're not gonna have bang chan's live streams anymore right but <laughs> cry emoji i know i'm so sad but those live streams are like literally him talking about nothing with fans and like so much content comes out of that that people love and i see that with p1 harmony and i think like if they keep doing that and not just kiho but like p1 harmony like they really have the potential to to move up into tier one yeah yeah i think p1 P- i would agree p1 harmony has got a real shot um at making their it. management is also really good i mean the american promotions have been really well done so far um they just need to keep up that momentum i know they're touring right now but and their their tour is extensive i mean they did the entire u.s they went to latin america they are currently in australia they did the whole asian subcontinent um but yeah, I, I just feel like they need to be consistent with their releases and mm. just because what the ultimately the measurement is the US popularity. So like they still need to like keep up with their US promotions and just getting on those YouTube channels for Glamour magazine or this or that or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't see the same fervor like requesting like granted this this whole category is like who who's 
you know, poise and set to become that next breakout. So, you know, they're not you should popular. Play, do it like that next time. Yes. Uh, that like will get people yeah. dancing. No, yes. I, I, I like, I actually, no, I, I do it like this is, is one of my favorite, um, what I would call like my 9 50, 10 PM time slot song where it's like, it's just the beginning of the part. Like, you know, doors have already opened for like maybe about an hour and people are slowly getting in. But once you get like a critical mass of people to start vibing, like then you play do it like this. Um, mm. So I, I like that song a lot too. But like when I play songs like Back Down, like you, you can tell. Oh yeah. Like yeah, that's a good uh, one too. That's a good the, one. The the fandom they get excited by it. Like all the people who know really get excited by Back Down. Jump is a song I really it was a hit replay for me a few episodes ago. But like that that's a. One of my favorite songs, but I haven't unfortunately seen the same traction for it. Um, I think Jump like suffered from just it, the timing of the release. Like there were just yeah. so many other like really big releases around the same time that it totally eclipsed this one. They got mm-hmm. lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they've been working. I I remember what, what year was it that I saw them with Stephanie? Um, was it a year ago? Two years ago? Uh, maybe it's 2021, 2022, but we, we saw them in San Jose and I remember going to that concert and, you know, it was, a, it was obviously a sold out concert, but it felt like they didn't have a lot of material to go off of um, at the time for that concert. Mm. Uh, so maybe that's what was kind of holding them back from being like critical mass of material to work with, mm. um, you know, to become the next thing but i I'm, I'm sure they'll get there pretty quickly yeah um okay so uh who wants to go next um i think you should go peter okay so uh there there was a lot of contenders i i want to call out that um what, what, what's the name of this girl group uh kiss of life um, yes, Kiss mm-hmm. of Life. Mm-hmm. I think they were a real strong contender just because I'm starting to see a lot of people cover their songs. Shh. But at mm. the same time, like when I'm in the wild in K pop places, no one really knows it. So it hasn't, even within the K pop, like it, it, it's, uh, it's there with their early adopters, but not you know, quite yet recognize or evokes a, a reaction from uh, the mainstream, I put that in air quotes, mainstream K-pop fans. Um, so I would say not them yet, but there is another artist who has that early adopter uh, K-pop dance cover fervor. Um, and when I play really just their one song at this point, uh, I can see the excitement from the more mainstream crowd. And that group is um, Zero Base One uh, and, and really their only song at, at this point. Um, oh my God, what is the name of their song? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, In Bloom. There we go. So, yeah, I, I would say they, they've got real momentum. Wait is, wait, is In Bloom a cover? No. No, I don't it's think so. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay, because you were talking about covers with Zero Based One, and I was like, wait, what? Okay. Uh, dance covers from, like, uh, dance, you know, K-pop dance teams. Hmm. Got it. I mean, Zero Based One is... I think they're just, you know, using up that Boy's Planet energy right now, and they have, like, a really strong fandom behind them. Um KCON day two, I believe, was like mm-hmm. literally zero base one all day long. <laughs> yeah. They appeared on every single stage. They did pre-show, post-show, main stage, everything. Um, from, from based on what my Genius Korea writers told me. But I, I think they need a second comeback for me to yeah. s- s- realize if they are going to keep up that momentum. Because I feel like right now especially with these k-pop groups that are formed from survival shows and a lot of these members are previous idols from different things they have solo stuff happening here and there when groups don't do group activities together a lot the Mm -hmm. fandom starts breaking apart like 
Mm. Even right now, their debut album has a solo song out on the album, which was the winner's prize, I guess. Mm -hmm. And his fans are on a whole other route of like, we just need to stream his song. We don't care about the other stuff. We don't mm -hmm. care about the group. Like, this is it. This is his solo, 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 solo. And I feel like Zero Base One is going to have a very hard time regrouping if they don't release a second comeback or they don't promote heavily as a group. Mm. But, yeah. Yeah, so I, I was at KCON and I got to see Zero Base One and I I can confirm that the fans were going crazy for their performances. Um, and, you know, they don't even have, like, an official light stick because they're so new. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I... You know, I will say it's if it's not obvious by now for, you know, people who do love Zero Base One, like I didn't watch the reality TV show. So I literally only know of them so insofar as like their music and like what they've yeah. released so far. Um, but so when I was at KCON, I saw um, I was like in the pit waiting for ATs <laughs> to do like their interview with um, uh, the local radio station here, um, KISS FM. And I saw some people that had like um, these, like they looked like uh, they look like um, what's the best way to describe this? Like if Barbie had like um, a like a queen a queen staff, you know, it almost looked so it looked like a mm. like a big toy, right? And it blew bubbles, and it had like little wings on the side, so it was like pink and purple, and it was blowing bubbles. And there were three people that had that and they, you know, were blowing bubbles. And I was like, oh, how cute. They like brought bubbles for for KCON, you know, to entertain themselves. And then somebody across the pit starts screaming and then holds up the same light stick. So I'm really confused and I'm like, what's going on here? Later on, I see somebody with the light stick again and I'm like, I didn't know. Sorry. At this point, I didn't know that it was a light stick. I just thought it was a toy that blew bubbles. And I'm like, oh. what are you guys holding? And I asked this girl, she's with her mom, presumably her mom, because somebody who's significantly older and this was like a teen. And I was like, I'm sorry, like, can you just tell me like, what, what is this? And she's like, oh, it's because, I forget the member's name, from Zero Base One, like they don't have a light stick, but you know, he bought one recently. So fans have been using this as like the unofficial light stick for Zero Base One. And I was like, that's, right. oh, that, that's a real sign of like momentum and traction. And where, I was like, like that's yeah. crazy. So then I started spotting it around KCON, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh my gosh, people are using this as their light stick. I was like, that means the fandom is crazy excited about this group. Yeah. Um, I will say, I love their, I love, what is it, Bloom or In Bloom? In Bloom. Yeah. In yeah. Bloom. I think that's a great K-pop song, but I totally agree. They need another song. They need more um, activities together for people to get yeah. to know them like as a group. They're having a comeback in November. Ooh. Okay. And they announced it like four months ahead, which was like interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think, Teresa, it's, it's your turn. Let, let's, let's hear your breakout nomination. So going off of like, KCON. <laughs> At KCON, uh, I also got to see another rookie group debut, um, and that is Rise. Uh, it's the new group out of um, SM Entertainment. It's like if you're an N if you're an N citizen, which shame. I feel like Alexis, if she was here, she'd be like, you know really upset that we didn't mention NCT at all, <laughs> like or NT <laughs> NCT 127 in like our discussion about tier one groups. Uh, but neither oh, yeah, you're there. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's we're, such we're a not, good not, call out. Uh, not, not to like go back. Um, I was thinking about that, like during our conversation, I was like, oh my God, we didn't talk about NCT. I, and I, I, was think, like, I think NCT, I hate to say it, is like borderline tier one. I think they're on the, like, like if there's a top 10 list, there's probably like a number I 11. I hate to say it that... They are old. Um, I so, just even yeah. dream Anyways. is old. Listen, on that note, 
right? Like we didn't mention NCT and I'm not going to say anything else about them because I don't want to be kicked off my own podcast with Alexis. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, you can, you can say whatever. We can no, talk super no, no, senior no. and uh, um, Alexis is going to disown you. What, what, are, what are all the <laughs> things that like trigger Alexis? Like, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Um, Go ahead. Anyways, so we didn't mention NCT. I was like, we didn't talk about N-Hypen either, but you know, it's similar discussion, I think, to N TXT could be had there. So to your point, um, Syed, about NCT, the members are older. Rise mm -hmm. is the new group from SM Entertainment that has um, two former N NCT U uh, members, Shotaro and Sungchan, and that was like big news for like end citizens everywhere when like they were basically, I don't want to say they were kicked out, but they were removed from NCTU. And then SM was like, we're going to have them debut in a new boy group. Right. So I, you know, was like, what's going on here? Rise finally debuts and they make their big, like, I guess, splash in the US at KCON. That was like their big moment to shine because they were, um, they didn't have like, obviously they're so new that they only have like two songs. Um, they were part of the, uh, I guess it's called like the opening, they were like the opening act for one of the nights. And I will tell you this, I think that they definitely, like they came on and they killed it. They have charisma they can definitely perform and they can get the audience hype because I feel like all of the people who were rooting already for Shotaro and Sungchan and NCT are just like, oh my gosh, this is the group now to stand. Like even Alexa said it where she was like, I had the doors closed to, um, you know, stand new boy groups that she would stand. She was basically like, there's no more boy groups that I'm going to stand. And then she <laughs> saw this group and she's like, oh, Spoke too soon. Spoke too soon. Um, now, it's not just the two of them, obviously. Rise is a seven-member boy group. So it has Shotaro, Unsok, um, Sangchan, Wanbin, who, by the way, face card, never declined. <laughs> uh, Sanghan, Sohi, and Anton. Uh, so they made their debut in on September 4th of this year with um, the single Get a Guitar which is like, for my personal taste, a little too like cutesy and like Disney Channel. You know, it's like, oh, if you want to something, something, get a guitar, you know, and I was like, You're huh. skateboarding around on it. Yeah, I was like, this is a little too preteen for me, but obviously I'm not their target audience, you know, but their song Memories, I think is like, mm, it's like in bloom. It just has like a really fresh, easygoing, happy, like boy group song, you know? So it's like, mm. instead of get a guitar, if I were skateboarding, I'd rather have memories playing in the background. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I think that they are, they're too new to like really predict the future, but I definitely think that they're already gonna pull, they already have the advantage of pulling fans from um, the end citizen universe <laughs> over to support them. And they're all so young that, you know, I don't, they're not going to go any, away anytime soon, you know, at least I hope not. And they're the next boy group out of SM. So like, I don't really see them yeah. like, come on, like that's, that's a powerhouse right now. Okay. Not non sequitur, but can I ask a controversial question? <laughs> just ask peter <laughs> yeah why do i have to yeah just just put it out there um okay so is zero base one is rise gen five yes i have many thoughts on this <laughs> <laughs> but i take issue with the fact that people say that we're in gen, in gen five right now oh I yes think spill it's it too yes. early Say, I think say it's more. too early. Why? Why? I think it's way too early because however which way you – and I'm curious to hear, Syed, like what you think and why you think it's Gen 5. Okay. Like historically speaking, like the reason that we classify generations of K-pop is because there are certain groups that come to be – that like become the defining group of that era, right? 
So they're consistently charting, they sell out, et cetera. Um, and they have lasting power potentially also, not always, but potentially. And there's like certain technological like advances. That sounds really bizarre. There's like a specific yeah, no, way no, that the, they promote. The technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that they promote yeah, yeah, yeah. their groups. So you see that with like Gen 2, Gen 3, you know, Gen 3 was like, um, I'm sorry, like Gen 2 uh, variety shows. Then you have YouTube. Then you have like Instagram, social media. And then it's like now we have TikTok. And I think that's what fourth gen has really figured out how to do. And we've mentioned that earlier, like with groups like La Seraphin, um, P1 Harmony, et cetera. I see these newer groups like Rise and Zero Base One as being like part of Gen 4, but like at the halfway point. I think right now we're solidly in the halfway point of um, fourth gen. And if you kind of like think about it in terms of like groups and their standard, excuse me, if you think about groups and their standard like seven year contracts, like TXT debuted in what, like 2019, I think? You know, yeah. like a 2018, oh, yeah, 18. Yeah. 18. So like those groups still have a few years. They're not going away. So they're still going to be releasing songs and these newer groups are still going to be competing against them. So I don't like, I don't know. I just, I see it as like, we're in the 0.5 generation right now. And I don't think anything crazy dramatic has happened um, mm. enough to justify saying like, oh, this is a completely new generation and tomorrow we mentioned her earlier, like she has a K-pop newsletter. I forget what it's called, but it's a, oh, uh, it's like notes, a on notes. Yeah. notes on K-pop. Notes on K-pop. But she also talked about this where she said, you know, um, a lot like calling these groups fifth gen or the leaders of fifth gen is really ultimately like a PR spin. Mm -hmm. And I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. I agree with everything you just said. Wait, I, I thought you th you thought they were fifth gen. No, so I just okay. The reason why I think that they are fifth gen mm -hmm. is because I I okay. Here's the thing. Okay, personally, I think generations. I feel like when you were when people were in second gen, when they were experiencing second gen as it was happening, mm -hmm. they weren't thinking about like a first gen and a second gen i feel like the con conversation about generation started happening towards the end of third gen when people started recognizing the decade split that happened where 2010 2012 was like lots of groups debuted in those two years and they have been defining the rest of the decade i think it's like because exo is third gen Mm -hmm. and NCT came after EXO, they are automatically, for me, fourth gen. Really? Rise okay. comes after NCT, so it's like the next thing, which is fifth gen. And so I just think like that's how I'm looking at it, because mm. 80s is fourth gen. I don't think Zykers can be... <laughs> called fourth gen or like in the equivalent of 80s because they are much younger and they are quite new um mm. so i'm just looking at it from that perspective i guess but i do agree that it is definitely a pr spin because we get press releases all the time and zero base one like that is their tagline it is the fifth gen leader fifth gen leader and it's like well they haven't been out for like a month or anything yeah. you know you, how are you defining a leader if the debut has just happened like two months ago so yeah I, it's generations always it's just like a touchy subject that i don't want yeah, to we touch. could have a whole discussion about that yeah. like a whole episode but what do you think yeah. peter mm, well i mean like look hindsight of 2020 we're gonna have a uh, obviously just just like it's very nature we're gonna have better consensus around what fifth gen is after it's like already happened um like or, or after we're already like well into it or after a gen 4 is like really closed out so uh i would say in terms of the zeitgeist and vibe 
that you described, Teresa, around mm-hmm. oh, there has to be the the main acts from the major houses, <laughs> the major mm-hmm. labels, mm-hmm. Uh, who are then like in their like you know dethroned or retirement or uh, legacy era, mm-hmm. and um, th- there's probably the follow on from those signature acts and i would agree with your other criteria Teresa, around there has to be something new about the consumption model or the promotion model or the production model um we, we talked about tiktok short form content being one or uh, youtube being one um so i would agree with that as a vibe mm-hmm. i think it's hard to measure and pinpoint those things uh i think also like let's check in in three years you know like let's check in in three (laughs) four years i think we'll definitely be at the beginning of like fifth gen because at that point like the rookie groups that are you know zero base one will have ended their what is it their two-year contract so we'll see what happens with those members um rise we'll see if they you know, follow and become the next SM boy group. Um, and then groups like TXT um, and Stray Kids will, and ATs will be at that point, not veterans, but, you know, they'll, I mean, yeah, they'll be veterans essentially in the group. They and will be any, veterans. yeah, they'll literally. Be in their military so, era. <laughs> and I think about like my niece who is actually, she just turned 20. It's bizarre. But um, in my mind, she's still 18 because of the pandemic. So she's a MOA. She's like a hardcore, like TXT stan. And I think about her and I'm like, okay, by the time she finishes college, you know, and like a new boy group debuts, she's going to feel it. She's going to feel like, oh, these new boy groups debuting, like they're a whole different generation, you know? Yeah. So I just feel like give it three, four years and things will, will be in, in Gen 5, whether there are new tech advances or not, you know? I also think, like, 4th Gen hasn't been... Like, as you were saying, like, 4th Gen needs to be in their inconsistent comeback. One of them is in the military. One of them is doing dramas now. Exactly. Like, that era. like EXO is in that zone right now. That's why I feel like I am, I am an XOL from day one, but I'm like, okay, they are kind of good they did their thing they Mm -hmm. made their impact they have a legacy and that's it like now it's like they are doing other things and that's fine and i feel like like for example stray kids or txt like they are not doing that right now they are not focusing on solo activities or you know branching out into different things i feel like because they are still can't very even much. really, right? Like, I don't even know that their contracts would probably allow for that because they have to promote so heavily during the first yeah. few years. Yeah, so yeah. I feel like that's a really good point because it's like, you know that things have shifted generationally when like the the king makers, you know, or the hit makers mm-hmm. um, are able to coast. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, let's, let's move us on to the other spicy stuff. Cool. Um, sorry, like... Uh, well, mm-hmm. yeah, so let, let, let's get into let's see where are we on the outline. Okay, yeah, spicy Speaking item of fifth gen, <laughs> yeah. Well, we, uh, well, we, we should, yeah, separate episode for continued fifth gen discussion, but uh, okay, A2K, the show that certainly a lot of people were following, but I think more people are paying attention now, now that this group has debuted. Uh, has announced its final lineup with <sighs> I, I cannot Six pronounce Six members. Vacha. Vacha. Is that is Vicha. that the pronunciation guy we're going with? I don't know. <laughs> Cause I You tell me. Yeah. Yeah. I I was reading the Crystal Bell um Teen Vogue uh, interview. Teen Vogue yeah. yeah. And and uh <laughs> I think it sounds like the members themselves were uh, surprised by this naming. <laughs> I I feel I like we know. should spell it out. So it's V C H A, and we think yeah. it's Vacha, Vicha. 
I think it, okay, I don't know if this is like a short form of something, but apparently it means light. Yeah. I don't know in which mm. language, but one of their fan bases tweeted about it. They already have a fan base, by the way. Um, they tweeted about it and said something along the lines of it's something to do with light and being a light or something like that. Yeah, I think their concept is being like role models for a new yeah. generation. <laughs> Q yeah. end of generation co- conversation um, of, uh, you know, up and coming uh, young adults. Okay. So anyway, um, they've made their JPU. And uh, I think we were just going to be Daybok or not on this, but I think we need to have a fuller discussion. This, this is just really profound, mainly because I, I say this as like a Western North American K-pop fan, but the talent was sourced from North America. So you've got Lexi from yeah. Milwaukee, Camilla from Montreal, uh, Savannah from Fort Lauderdale, Kendall from Fort Worth, KG from L.A., Kaylee from Philadelphia, I think, who is it? Uh, KG, I want, I want to say. Um, we're not any strangers to seeing pale idols in blonde hair. <laughs> but I think, like, I think uh, I, I was sort of, like, reverse culture shock. Like, wow, it's a white, it's a blonde white girl, um, you know, in, a, in an actual K-pop group. And I was like, we're at that stage now, like where, like that, you know, I, that's yeah. just not what I would think of seeing in a K-pop group, but there it is. So here's my thoughts about this. So basically A2K stands for America to Korea. They did all, almost like American Idol kind of um, auditions throughout the U.S., uh, JYP personally attended all of those auditions, so he was in the selection committee. And then they went through a survival show kind of uh, situation, like we are known for, like Girls Planet or Produce 101. Or 16. Uh, yeah, where they had like 16 members or something? Or Yeah, yeah something no, sorry. Like that. Yeah. 16, uh, yeah, the, the thing that formed twice. But yeah, they went through all of that. They had challenges and cover stages and all of that Shazam. And then they have a lineup of six girls uh, that you mentioned. So here's my thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. JYP has done non-Korean groups before. So Nitsu Yu, which is their J-pop group. Yep. Um, But Nitsu Yu, unlike other J-pop groups and other... Asian groups under K-pop labels, they promote heavily in Japan and that's it. They don't do any sort of Korean promotions necessarily, maybe like a stage here and there, but that's it. Well, that's I, that's also like a symptom of that market too. I think like yeah. J-pop as a market is very insular, you know, not, not trying to be globalized. Yeah, but like I'm just thinking of like is A2K's li- final lineup by called Vacha or whatever, are they going to be promoted as an American group or are they going to be promoted as a K-pop group? And I feel like they're going to do a K-pop route because they've already debuted on Music Bank last right. night. Yep. Um. So, like, what was the point of doing a North American audition if you're going to still do the whole K-pop route of music because, shows? And because of where they all come from. <laughs> Sad because they're they 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 look like us and they come from our neighborhood. <laughs> and I I don't get it. Like I, because if because their mot- motto initially when they were doing the auditions was to make because this is in collaboration with Republic Records, so they're trying to make an American girl group. If you're doing an American girl group, a 13 year old member is not going to fly with American audiences. <laughs> so. I'm just confused. Like, what is JYP trying to do here? Uh, I I don't know. Sad. Like, you you say thirteen wouldn't fly, and I would agree with that in an objective moral sense. But uh, new jeans. I mean, like they've got. But new jeans isn't 
in the U.S. Right? No. Like they're still a K-pop group. <laughs> but not- but New Jeans has that mainstream penetration in North America right now. Amongst K-pop fans, K-pop fans, and if not, oh, they but are no, top I, 40. I would uh, not top forty. Mm-hmm. Okay, no, here's no, like, they're, they're getting there. Like <laughs> no, L- I L- think L- it's G. different. So like, okay, I keep mentioning KCON, but it, part of the reason that I bring them up into the, this conversation is because they had that stage um, with the local radio station here, Kiss FM, which is um, part of I think it's iHeartRadio. So it's a huge, huge radio station, and they had a special like quote unquote village and stage area and the DJ um uh Jojo on the radio who's like a long mainstay here in like LA he talked about how the radio station was you know finally was extending their K-pop uh show on Sundays to like a full hour okay and I remember when they debuted that as a program on the radio station and I was shocked I was like, oh my gosh, there's like K-pop after K-pop on like FM radio, you know, and it was just a 30 minute slot. Now it's one hour, but it's still under, it's still on Sunday. It's still like at 7 p.m. It's still something that they're like testing out to see if it has the potential to grow. But other than like the occasional K-pop song being like thrown in to like FM radio, you're not... Aside from BTS, maybe now you'll have other songs. Like, I don't really see... K-pop is still its own thing. It's not... Yeah, also, well. I will add that New Jeans, even if, like, for example, Oh My God was, like, really big. Even if people know the songs, like, especially non-K-pop fans know the songs, they don't know the members. And the whole conversation about New Jeans' age only happened because of the song that they were promoting, Cookie. And all of that conversation was still within the K-pop realm of like, this is a way too young, these girls are way too young and they're singing about Cookie. Right. And so that conversation, and still, (laughs) if you think about it, New Jeans is still 16 plus. Kaylee is technically 12, Korean age 13 kind of situation, which is, I feel like, way too young for what Americans think when they think of girl groups, they know Fifth Harmony, Little Mix, Destiny Child, even Blackpink. Like they know them as full adults. I I just feel like a, such a young group is not going to do well with an American audience. This can fly in K-pop, but I don't think it's going to fly in the American sphere if that I'll is what their goal is. I will add to that, that in the U.S., the only really, really young pop idols that we have are former Disney Channel stars. So Miley Cyrus, uh, Olivia Rodrigo. She I just looked up her age. She like just turned 20, you know, (laughs) so she has that teenage fandom, but it's been something that she's been cultivating for years and not necessarily even through music. So I don't think like a YouTube reality TV show for a K-pop group is going to have that same kind of, you know, pull as these other young pop artists in the U.S. have. Also, like most of those artists, when they did do their mainstream debut, they tried to break away from the Disney Channel image, right? Like what is the story that A2K is trying to show? Like, are they just going to cater towards Radio Disney? Or are they going to try to do the, oh, we're breaking away from that image? Because what is that image? I mean, if you haven't watched the YouTube channel, the YouTube reality show, like, you have no idea who these girls are. So Right. But they're they're, they're generating noise now. I I think there was just a lot of people who who didn't watch uh, the, the, the reality show. But, like, whoa, this is a group. Here's the thing. I I mean, this is part of a longer discussion and I don't I don't want to like beat a dead horse. But like when it comes to promoting pop music in the US, like you need to do the interviews on the radio stations. Like you need to do the mm. casual right. um interviews with like people, I'm sorry, like entertainment reporters who by right, and large right. like don't really know yeah. anything about your music and your yeah. group and you need charisma for that. 
And yeah. like that is one of the big challenges that K-pop artists face when they come here. Not that they don't have charisma, but that there's a language barrier and that these entertainment reporters don't know anything about them, you know? Yeah. So you get really cringy interviews that like don't hit the same as like the Korean variety shows or it's Korean YouTube paradigm. shows. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> okay. Well, I, I think there's going to be interest in this group is, is my theory um, in a sense that they're like a better executed black swan. Um, mm. I love black swan. Don't do that. Well, yeah, no, I, I like black swan's last song too, but as an Indian, I am standing black swan right now, hard right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, uh, we'll see what has happens. More money than Black I, Swan. I think we'll see what happens. A two K is going to go down the XG route. Oh um, yeah, that's a good. That's none a good of them are Korean, but they are promoting as a K pop group. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting if XG is going to be nominated at K pop shows. I don't the think award they will. shows and stuff. But I, I, I hate to say it, even though, oh my god. We, go back to the tier one discussion i think xg is tier two but like probably tier one pretty soon uh at least in north america like they are like all the k-pop circles people ask for K xg songs and stuff tgif was in the running for my hit replay this week um but uh koreans hate them <laughs> like Oh, they're a Japanese group. Like, like, how could you be any more anti-Korean by like having you know these like I don't know whatever. For example, like I'll I'll post like uh, recordings of gigs and stuff, and I'll you know people you can see like Koreans are, are are reading and watching these videos, and then when they see like XG, what why why did you play XG at this like K-pop thing like, <laughs> and then it gets like this whole like mini flame war between like. <laughs> Is actually K-pop, um, but I, I, we don't know how to classify them either. It's very yeah. hard. I I think honestly, I'm glad that you mentioned this group um, and XG because I feel like going back to our discussion about K-pop generations, I think that's what we're gonna see in like fifth gen. It's and I think Tamar mm. actually wrote about this as well. So I'm gonna mention her plug her newsletter one more time. Um, that, that like one, in yeah. fifth gen. You know, it's just we're going to have more of these groups that are like, what genre industry? Like, how do we even classify them? Because the yeah. members themselves will hail from so many different places. Yeah. XG has a bright future if their producer doesn't F it up. Because <laughs> I feel like they're going to, they have that tendency of going down the Blackpink route where they only have one producer. And right now the songs are hitting. It's gonna get repetitive if they don't bring in other people to make music for them. Mm, that's a good point. But uh, good transition. Uh, well, uh, sorry. If, if I could just say one more thing about Vacha. Oh my god, I feel like this is gonna Vacha. be like Voyager, Viger. <laughs> Shout out if you get that Star Trek reference. Um, like I. Can, can we just talk about the diversity aspect of the group and be like, you know, the the backgrounds in this group and, and what that means? Like what, like, I, I, I don't know. I just want to pull on that thread a little bit more. Like, what is your guys' reaction to just the diversity of the, of the members? Like, to be sure, we've had a lot of international members in going back to uh, Gen 2 K-pop groups, but like what? I, I think it's different this time around. I think it, it's going to be K-pop model, like paradigm business model, but mm -hmm. um, North American backgrounds, like making it more relatable for the North North American market. But so anyway, what are, what are your guys' thoughts on the diversity piece of this? I mean, I feel like this is going to continue to be a conversation. <laughs> because you just reminded me also about like Hive's contest for their new girl group, which also has contestants from like around the world. Uh -huh. um, Academy. Yeah. yeah. 
and it's like I re- there's like Latinas on there. Like I, I was like, what? You know, <laughs> um, Europeans. Um, I am going to reserve my I'm going to try to reserve my judgment here on any of these groups right now, because unfortunately, I see it primarily as a marketing gimmick right now. And I don't know. I don't I don't, I don't really have more thoughts other than that right now just like diversity washing basically i don't know if i'll go so far as to say it like that but i it doesn't yeah i i just feel like they haven't really thought it through you know yeah fully i i agree with that sentiment i think it's gonna be interesting how the members fare in the k-pop world um if they're going to be performing on music shows and stuff like that because we've seen that happen with uh, black swan members and so i don't i mean the a2k group i'm i'm gonna avoid saying the name i'm just gonna be like a2k group um for the longest time um a2k group i feel like they still have they still keep that image of a k-pop group I'd hate to say this, but most of the girls are light skinned. Um, and so d- the Dream Academy, I feel like, ha- is going to be interesting as well because they do have a lot more international artists. Uh, this one was more focused on North America. So, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting how the Korean audience will respond to this. I, I feel like yeah. because K pop has just become so globalized the k-pop model and paradigm has become international like right we have our own lingo terminology ways of engaging as a fan Mm -hmm. that this is not trying to get the domestic korean market it's trying to get more of the north american market but through the k-pop model if that makes sense like all the North American K-pop fans are the target audience for this sort of thing. I mean, I do appreciate the fact that they trained through the K-pop, um, what is it, model? Mm-hmm. Um, because I think what was there? There was another group from Europe that was getting criticized for using the K-pop sound and everything, but they did not go through the training process that K-pop idols do. Oh and yeah, so, what, what was the name of that what was group? The name of that group. I want to say there was like an E or an F in there in their name. Yeah, I'm. It's just slipping out of my mind right now. But they were mainly criticized because they did not go through the K-pop idol system, and they were just using the K-pop sound and the colors the aesthetic, and the, yeah, yeah, the aesthetic of it. But A2K did go through that process, and they're gonna go through that process before they debut um, as the group. Because the songs hmm. that they have released right now is just a pre-debut song, so they're not. Do you know they haven't officially debuted? <laughs> so for the academy, are they also going to? Are they just going to go through like the audition process, which is you know filmed and then they debut, or yeah, do so they actually? The, yeah, the Dream Academy, from what I know, is going to be similar to a survival show, where. Um, I don't know if there will be like live voting aspect of it, like other survival shows, but they are going to go through the whole survival show system of getting eliminated, the training, the, you know, splitting into subunits and all of that to then end up with the lineup, which will eventually debut. So the lineup isn't going to, that's not the debut of the group. You know what I mean? Like, Zero Base when Boys Planet ended in March or so. Then they had a period of time where they trained as Zero Base One and then they debuted in August. So Yeah, because I was gonna A2, say talking yeah. about the K pop format and in and uh model, like the training aspect is such a big thing about that. I mean yeah. fans yeah. talk about that all the time. Like, oh my gosh, like my favorite idol trained for was a trainee for like four years, you yeah. know. I think that's a very big, like a pillar almost, because that's, I mean, most former K-pop idols also talk about the fact that 
they hated everything else, but they respect that model and that system of, you know, training and the dedication that goes into it and all of that. And that I feel like a lot of people value that. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, th I see that being an issue because I don't mm. see that translating well over into like the U.S. and like our current pop music landscape where it's like, the again, Disney only other yeah. like place that I can think of that has a system like that in place. Yeah. yeah. With it comes certain opportunities and baggage. Um, you know, the, the training model means like you're really investing in the person. Although sometimes business models can make that like uh, slave labor indentured servitude. But uh, you know, at the same time you're, 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 you're really, fostering and developing the talent whereas like in the um western paradigm it's more like who's already famous who can we extract yeah. and monetize um like you know especially you've got like tiktok air quote stars you know maybe music wasn't their career path but it's a way to monetize their influence um so uh, in, in conversely with that uh, I think you have a lot more independence and freedom to jump around with the Western model. Whereas like in the K-pop model, you know, there's more like looking at you 50, 50, you're, you're kind of <laughs> screwed because you're, you know, uh, indebted to like who brought you up. So there's less flexibility to jump around. Yeah. I think this gets into a very deeper and murkier conversation but there are pros and cons to both of it and right. it's like you know for example like the one big thing that always comes to mind is like k-pop idols almost never have to go through vocal cord surgery because they're trained to sing <laughs> and they learn how to sing um, whereas Western artists, almost every artist, once they go on tour, <laughs> they come off of it and they're like, we need vocal cord surgery. Their vocals are fried. So because they're not training and it's like a, yeah. oh, about like, oh, raw, raw talent and this and that. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation of like. Okay, let's move on yeah. to hot issues. Okay. All right, so day back or not. So day back or not, it's a rapid fire thing. So I'll I'll say the thing, and then you say your day back, glass half, glass half full or not, glass half empty on that thing. However you choose to interpret it. So, um, are you guys day back or not on allegedly Blackpink's Rose being the only one to renew her contract with YG? So are you day back or not on? potentially other members of Blackpink leaving YG, Lisa getting hella bank. What do you think? <laughs> I know. She she is definitely, I feel like, has the upper hand right here. Um, I'm honest. This is going to be controversial. I'm, I'm Debak on this. I feel like the girls have had a really solid run. Yep. And it's become evident over time that they all have different interests. You know, Jisoo wants to do acting. She has an actor boyfriend now. <laughs> like <laughs> Lisa is abroad and like is flourishing and thriving, you know, living her best life in Europe. Um, like, I just feel like the girls are at a point where it's like, they want to do different things. Let them. Yeah, me too. Debak. Yep. Debak. I think Rose is the only one who really wants to focus on her music and because she's a songwriter primarily so yeah yep makes sense yep okay debak next item are you guys debak or not on irene rumored to have not or choosing not to renew her contract with sm entertainment <sighs> Irene i'm Red not debak um yeah i'm, I'm not, not debak with that on this yeah I, so, so, so irene more. does not have that kind of presence where I feel like she can go solo or do something else. Yeah, but maybe she just, just wants to leave the industry. If she wants to do that, that's more power to her. Yeah, if she and wants to just, more you know, <laughs> be like a brand ambassador for and, you know, do sponsored content here and there, like, all yeah. I can definitely see her doing that. But uh, in terms of creative pursuits, I, I don't know that it's the best move. Mm. 
Yeah. yeah, but I don't know. Maybe she just wants to leave entertainment completely, you know? Like something completely different. Like she wants to become a IT business analyst. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I guess I'll go not for the same reason as you guys. Are you guys debuck or not on Kepler's contract extension being under discussion? I am... Okay. I don't know if Kepler is the right group to do this right now. <laughs> but at the same time, I feel like their best option is to remain a group together. Um, but whatever the result of this discussion is going to be, it's going to impact other survival show groups that are coming out. Because Eyes One was so popular, they did not renew the contract. So, Yeah, I I, I'm Tebak for the same reasons. Um, I do think that the difference here with Kepler and Eyes One is just the popularity of certain members. Yeah. Like with Eyes One, you obviously had like stars that had their own fandom, <laughs> you know, idols that had their own fandoms, even when they were a part of Eyes One. I don't know that the same can be said for Kepler. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm Jaybok on something changing for Kepler. I don't think the group has a strong brand or concept identity. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's okay, Audrey. I'll open it. All right. So our next item. All seven members of BTS uh, renew their contracts with Big Hit. Daybok or not? Daybok. Daybok. Yeah. I mean, I want new music and I love the boys. So, yes. I mean, where boys, else boys, is, boys. are they going to go? Yeah. I well, just it just it doesn't like make they're sense. So, they're so big. Like, who is going to be able to pitch to them? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Lisa is right now under con like you know the um the money that she's gonna be she's being offered right now like it's you know seven members of BTS that's a lot of money and yeah. I will say this like I feel like um speaking about like where else would they go it's like big I feel like Hybe has allowed big hit um. I feel like Hybe is still allowing BTS to do all the collaborations that they want to do. So we're still getting like really awesome uh, music, you know, from the members as a group and as solo projects that I feel like makes the members happy. You know, it's not yeah. like it doesn't feel forced in in the way that it might with like another group. So, yeah. Yeah. Agree. Tadok. Yeah, we didn't say it earlier, but Seven is, is also probably like top five most requested songs um, by Jungkook. Uh, meanwhile, V, let's move on. So, uh, Lucembal Lu preserves group name winning their lawsuit over Blackberry. I, I am, am not Tebok on this. Oh. Um, and this is, hold on, so here are my reason. Yeah. I feel like they won Lucembal, right? It's not Luna, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, Alexis and I were talking about this the other day and how the tickets for Lucemble are just not really moving. And they had to actually we mentioned it in our new podcast episode, um, but, you know, they had to cancel a tour stop in Denver. Oh, and and I I was really I'm not in Denver, but I was sad for all the people in Denver. And honestly, like the it's I think it's partly I think the limitations that they have in not being able to use Luna to market themselves as a brand name and identity in all the ways, like is really hurting them. So like, yes, yeah, they won this name, yeah. great for them, but like, I'm not tied back on it because I would like to see them have, you know, win Luna. Yeah, me too. Um, also, I did not understand the point of the lawsuit. Like, Lucembal sounds very different than Luna. Um, like, what was Blockberry even trying to do here? But yeah, Lu Luna, the, from a branding perspective, yeah, Luna is more, it carries more weight, has more of an image. Yeah, they've got, they did two fan signings here in the Bay Area. Two, one in San Francisco, one in San Jose. Shout out to Sarang Hello in Cloud K-pop. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, sorry, not to knock those two uh local retailers too much but at the same time uh maybe that was only done because <laughs> they're trying to sell tickets and uh maybe they're not doing as well without having that little brand okay 
So I guess I'm not with you guys. Um, are you guys Jaybok or not on Sensitive? They're, I guess, the, the name of the group and uh, their new uh, music video. I liked it. Skip me because I'm not like super familiar okay, with it. Skip. Um, I guess... The music video was interesting because they promoted the tour in the music video. <laughs> Uh oh, I've never seen that happen in K-pop before. No, Twice did that before. For like a main music video, not like a side music. Yeah, video. they did it. They did it for uh the feels. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Okay. Well, I had never seen that one. I never noticed it before. But yeah, this was interesting because the whole music video happened, which was a very different vibe. Mm -hmm. And then cut to, I guess, she was dreaming in a pod in a space station or something. And they were heading towards their cities that they were going to perform in. It was really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Uh, are you guys Daybok or not on BTS member V lauding his dog, Yantan, for being the first ever K-pop artist? He is so cute. Yeah, <laughs> That's all I have to say. It's cute. Enough said. It's so cute. <laughs> the fan cam is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> who who was it who had the fan cam of um like their like teddy bear or doll on as a part of their outfit? Oh, I'm totally forgetting who, who is the idol. But I feel like there's some precedent here for like fan cam and mini fandoms for inanimate objects. Pair with mean, the idol. Before all of this, there were the one that was that blew up was a fan cam of Sun Mi's backup dancer. Oh, but that's um, different. That's a real human being. And yeah, but like that was like of... a lot of fans were like, oh my god, he gets an he gets his own fan cam, and then obviously fans were drooling all over it. But yeah, like beyond that, he's so cute. Anyways. Netizens noticed low ticket sales for KBS's Immortal Songs live concert in New York. Daybok or not? <sighs> Are you Daybok or not on Immortal mm. Song Sales flop? Okay, I'm going to say... Mm. Um, so again, I have to explain myself. I'm not Daybok. Or I'm sorry, I'm, I am Daybok on this being a flop only insofar if it serves as a lesson to these labels that they cannot keep doing these like concerts, you know, with like really, really short notice um, at the end of the year <laughs> and expect, you know, fans to have pockets, you know, like bank accounts that are like limitless. Um, and I mentioned this because Alexis and I literally did a whole episode that just dropped this week. Um, we did a collaboration with the podcast, Not Your Average Fangirls. We had them on to talk about like the messiness of just K-pop tours right now and how certain tours. Oh like, yeah. Shout out to tomorrow's newsletter as well. Where again, exact, again <laughs> shout out to tomorrow again, friends of the pod, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we have just had so many tours this year that it's like festivals are suffering you know it's like a tiny like yeah. we saw them at kcon we saw them you know already on, people saw them in latin america like of course we want to support them but it's not that we don't but like how you know am i gonna go pay 250 dollars to see you know for like a seat in like the 200s you know like way up far away to see like Psy and see like two songs from like some of my favorite groups like no yeah my thing with this is that they aimed too high MetLife is a stadium that is way too big for a, a show that is not just ATs if it was just ATs then that would be a different kind of conversation of like oh they are doing a stadium show this is a roster of artists where K-pop fans might only know Psy, New Jeans, ATs, and maybe one Trot star. It's being immortal songs. The lineup ha is like lots of different veteran Korean singers who K-pop fans do not know about them. And so it is being marketed to the wrong audience. Plus, it is such a big venue for such short notice. The ticket prices are ridiculous. 
And also a side note, Studio Pav hasn't done a big show. <laughs> okay, their their clients are very small. Their venues are very small. I am very surprised that Studio Pav is actually doing such a huge scale thing. So it's just like a whole lot of different factors that are just not working in their favor. <laughs> well said. Yeah, shout out to the um, Korea Herald Hollywood Bowl event like that. That's why I think they should have been. Yeah, like they could have done like UBS Arena. You could, you you know, like Arena Show would have made more sense than a huge stadium where you have to fill so much of the space. Um, And it's going to be recorded. So, I mean, I'm just like, that would be really embarrassing if, you know, it's not decently selling. But but the uh, analogy I'm looking, trying to make here is that it's like the elder generation, like, you know, first generation immigrants. Uh, you know, who also have, you know, because they're in their elder years, they have more time and money to spend. However, there's fewer of them. And it's more of a, let's drink our wine and eat our cheese concert. But I just feel like they're not marketing it towards that audience, right? Right, like, right, right, right. They need to market it towards the age-appropriate audience who would yeah, know yeah. those artists and be like, oh my God, they're performing in New York. Like, I want to go. Yeah, right. So... Well, let's hope they learn their lesson. Yeah, yeah. So we're all not on that, it sounds like. Okay, so are you guys Daybok or not on... Oh, my God. Uh, Netizens being arranged after K-pop veteran Boa invites two fans onto her Instagram live. And one of them uh, starts showing porn in the background. Absolutely not. (laughs) Like, Daybok, what the fuck? Uh, Yeah. No. Like, I didn't know about this until I saw the outline for this episode. I'm, like, mad. And I wasn't on that yeah. live. I, that's yeah. stupid. And shit like this is what ruins what, for what the ruins the experience yeah. for all of the diehard fans. Because I hate it. Now it's like we not going to invite anyone. No. <laughs> and, like, she... Scared. Like, of course. And it's just like, you know, we talk about, I've heard one of the criticisms of like fourth gen idols is like, oh my gosh, they're like, you know, so reserved. Like they don't even interact with anybody else. Like they're afraid to even like talk to another K-pop idol. They're afraid to do this. And I'm like, well, it's because they go on a live and then dumb shit happens. Yeah. Yeah, walking on eggshells. I... My thing with this was that obviously it's horrible, but I also feel like a lot of the comments, this is so annoying, but a lot of the comments were blaming Boa for it. And I was like, what Mm. in the hell? Because they were saying like, oh, she should have been more careful. Like, not even in her wildest dreams, she would have thought that, oh, inviting a fan over and someone's going to show that in the background. Like, she did it because she was hopeful and she wanted to interact with fans. And Right, right, right. If anything, we should take it as like a sign that like, oh, she is not as jaded as the rest of us about what life on the internet is like. Sure. But I I really, I view this more of an issue with the platform. Like platform needs to have better warning for like high profile, high visibility uh, users such that when they go live, there needs to be like some sort of warning or, or caution and inviting people to go live with you. Um, Because, like, when you you can see it, like, when you get to a certain threshold on, like, Twitter or whatever, like, there's different safeguards, and something similar should have been done here, such that an actual, legit celebrity, you know, has to worry about content moderation, or is at least notified about the, the concerns of content moderation and toxicity before opening the floodgates okay so we're all not um are you guys jaybach or not on ruan uh choosing to focus on solo activities and SFI no continuing group as eight. no okay. no okay. <laughs> i'm so sad i'm so sad because like sorry the dogs are going crazy i'll let saeed talk because i know that you also have thoughts on this yeah okay I am kind of debak on this because I just 
feel like she he was stretching himself too thin with his health issues his back problems um he he had a lot of health issues by the way over the period of their 8 year contract or 7 year contract um and he was doing dramas and he was doing all these other things while also staying pretty active as a member of the group like he wasn't you know i i don't know if he has necessarily skipped any comebacks but um yeah i'm just like maybe it's for the good maybe it's for good you know for good reason because i just feel like he was doing too many things and it was just not going to work out sf9 is right now in their military era members are enlisting coming back um they are trying out different things and he completed his contract so it's not like he left them midway so yeah i might have disagree But with that just time, a little just bit like, <laughs> because like so i think it's sad like i agree tebak in the sense that he gets a break and he gets more hopefully work life balance because i i agree with you like his health was like a big concern i'm not tebak on it because of the timing like there okay. were some you know i think it was so, i might have been like a korea boo article or something but it was like haters were already getting on roan's case saying that he should leave the group because he quote unquote wasn't devoting enough time to promoting sf9 you know and then like yes, a week that. or two like later this announcement comes out and it's like f those people because he still participated in puzzle you know mm -hmm. um he was doing his best he loves the members you know and it's not his fault that you know fnc uh was not you know was saying like hey you have all of these dramas like you're not going to be doing this stuff you know and it just feels weird because it feels like it feels like the haters got to him and he was like all right yeah my con you know my contract's done like forget it yeah. and then they were like yeah you know what best for you to uh focus on these other things and it, i feel like fantasy never got like closure in that sense like literally he released yeah. a statement said that he's you know really sorry etc and then like i feel like the same day i saw um the official sf9 accounts promote saying you just doing regular promotion as if nothing ever happened and that feels weird to me yeah i i agree with that because um i feel like when contracts are up it becomes such a big discussion topic and then it's a whole thing of like who's renewing who's not renewing if he's if they are renewing what's going to happen if they're not renewing they're already getting offers mm -hmm. from different companies we ease into it we ease into it right but with sf9 there was no sort of no nothing happened like they just like he left and they were everyone was like oh that means everyone else renewed we're just going to yeah. assume that and he is not renewing oh. while staying under fnc yes so, and it's, it's like, like oh i don't know i'm like watching his latest drama too right now so i mean i'm obviously i'm supporting his like acting yeah. <laughs> capabilities but anyways not to back for me right so and then so sayed are you still to back on it I am debug on it because I just feel like it's l better for the long run, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm it's debug in a <laughs> same similar vein of doing what you want to do, whatever that ends up being. Okay. Uh last item. I guess debug or not on Girls Generation Hyoyeon launching her DJ tour in North America. I'll even add to that being the first SM artist in like 10 plus years to finally come to the Bay Area. <laughs> <laughs> But uh anyway, uh what do you guys think? I am interested in seeing what her set list is going to be like. Like is she going to be doing DJ stuff or is she going to be like a solo K-pop act? Well, Oh my gosh. So this this is a whole lot of discussion that maybe only myself and the other judgmental DJs in the room care about. But there's this whole trend of like being an underwear underwear model DJ like 
and like those underwear model DJs do a hell of a lot better than DJs who maybe have like more technical finesse. Um, and I think an extension of that along the, the trend of underwear model DJs, there's also producer DJs, DJs who aren't really DJs, but they're music producers, but they use the DJ moniker as a way to monetize their reach and influence and their brand. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's a similar thing here as much as, as I love DJ Hyo and Hyoyeon. Um, I don't think it's to, uh, I think SM Entertainment is certainly branding it as a DJ set, but I think the act, the, the performance is more the parasocial, let me see my idol, let her sing into the new world or G, like for an acapella. <laughs> And then play, you know, her EDM banger songs in a DJ set. And my theory is that she'll do two hours, like a set of two hours or so. Mm. And then she'll have someone open for her and close after her. Mm. And I know the venues that she's DJing at. Like, she, so she's doing Temple here in San Francisco. That's a, I love that venue. It's really close to my office. Um, and that that's a you know legit in the club 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 clubby club mm. for EDM acts for sure. Yeah, I I don't want to like stretch it out too much, but I just it's just interesting to me because Taeyeon, um, another Girls Generation member, she's the one currently touring uh, properly with like a concert tour in Southeast Asia, and so. Hyoyeon being promoted as a um, in the U.S. is just interesting. Like, is she gonna have like a proper like concert kind of tour? No, I think she's gonna, gonna like, like a, underwear model DJ, DJ route thing. But but not not DJ DJ more like underwear model headliner DJ. Like you know main image on the party flyer, whatever one buys tickets for. That's um, a new term that I've learned today. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I, I, that's not an industry common term. That's just DJ Peter Lowe's way of describing it. But yeah, so okay. I I say all that, but I'm Daybuck on it. Like I'm I'm good for idols trying different novel things, of getting out there. Yeah, I'm Tebuck on it. I feel like it'd be a good time. Yeah, it should be fun. I I'm gonna try to go if I can. <laughs> okay, so uh, that wraps it up. Um, uh, let us let listeners know where they can follow each of y'all on your socials and stuff. Yeah, you guys can follow us on Genius Korea. I don't have anything personal to promote. Please do not follow me on my personal accounts. Um, and yeah, Genius Korea. It's on Twitter, Instagram. We are we have a Threads. <laughs> uh, we have a TikTok account. Uh, yeah. If you want, if you like lyrics and translations and transcriptions of those lyrics and getting to learn more about the deeper meaning behind them, please check us out. All right. So you can follow me on Instagram at our podcast official account. So it's IKPT pod. It's pretty much where I'm like on the internet, uh, sharing stuff about, uh, our podcast. It's a K-pop thing, which is the show that I co-host with Alexis, who we has also been on the K-pop cast before. Um, we just released a new episode this week in partnership with, uh, not your average fangirls where basically like i said earlier we talk about the state of k-pop concerts right now and how we're all really really struggling to keep up all right i'm D at dj peter Lowe. you can follow me and see me at your k-pop dj gigs parties here in the san francisco bay area we can tweet no let, let, let's pretend we're not on twitter but you can thread us uh, at the k-pop cast or uh, DM us at the K Podcast on Instagram. All right, bye everyone. <laughs> Sada,